Good afternoon, everybody. It's four and a half years since the British people voted to take back control of their money, their borders, their laws, and their waters, and to leave the European Union. And earlier this year, we fulfilled that promise in that we left on January the 31st with that oven-ready deal. Since that time, we've been getting on with our agenda, enacting the points-based immigration system that you voted for and that will come into force on January the 1st, doing free trade deals with 58 countries around the world and preparing the new relationship with the EU. And there have been plenty of people who have told us that the challenges of the COVID pandemic have made this work impossible and that we should extend the transition period and incur yet more delay. And I've rejected that approach precisely because beating COVID is our number one national priority, and I wanted to end any extra uncertainty and to give this country the best possible chance of bouncing back strongly next year. And so I'm very pleased to tell you uh, this afternoon uh, that we have completed the biggest trade deal yet, worth £660 billion a year, a comprehensive Canada-style free trade deal between the UK and the EU, a deal that will protect jobs across this country, a deal that will allow goods, UK goods and components to be sold uh, without tariffs and without quotas uh, in the EU market, a deal which will, if anything, allow our companies and our exporters to do even more business with our European friends, and yet, which achieves something that the people of this country instinctively knew was doable, but which they were told was impossible. We've taken back control of our laws and our destiny. We've taken back control of every jot and tittle of our regulation in a way that is complete and unfettered. From January the 1st, we are outside the customs union and outside the single market. British laws will be made solely by the British Parliament interpreted by UK judge, judges sitting in UK courts, and the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice will come to an end. We will be able to set our own standards, to innovate in the way that we want, to originate new frameworks for the sectors in which this country leads the world, from biosciences to financial services, artificial intelligence, and beyond. We'll be able to decide how and where we're going to stimulate new jobs and new hope uh, with free ports, new green industrial zones. We'll be able to cherish our landscape and our environment in the way we choose, backing our farmers, backing British food and agricultural production. And for the first time since 1973, we will be an independent coastal state with full control of our waters. Uh, with the UK's share of fish in our waters rising substantially from roughly half today to closer to two-thirds in uh, five and a half years' time, after which there is no theoretical limit beyond those placed by science or conservation on the quantity of our own fish that we can fish in our waters. And to get ready for, those, uh, for that moment, uh, those fishing communities will be helped with a big £100 million pro pound programme to modernise their fleets and the fish processing uh, industry. And I want to stress that uh, although, of course, uh, the, the arguments with our European friends and partners were, uh, were sometimes uh, fierce, this, this is, I believe, a good deal for the whole of, uh, of Europe uh, and uh, for, uh, for our friends and partners as well because it will not be a bad thing, in my view, for the EU to have a prosperous and dynamic uh, and contented UK uh, on your doorstep. And it will be a good thing. Uh, it, will be, it will drive jobs and prosperity across the whole continent. And I don't think it'd be a bad thing if we in the UK do things differently or take a different approach uh, to legislation, because in so many ways, our basic goals are the same. And uh, in the context of this giant free trade zone that we're jointly creating, the stimulus of regulatory competition will, I think, benefit us both. And if one side 
believes it's somehow being unfairly undercut by the other, then subject to independent third party arbitration and provided the measures are proportionate, we can, either of us, decide as sovereign equals to protect our consumers or businesses. But this treaty explicitly envisages that such action should only happen infrequently. And the concepts of uniformity and harmonization are banished in favor of mutual respect and mutual recognition and free trade. And for, for squaring that circle, uh, for finding uh, the, the philosopher's stone that's enabled us to, to do this, I want to thank uh, President von der Leyen, Ursula von der Leyen of the uh, European Commission, uh, our brilliant negotiators led by uh, Lord Frost uh, and Michel Barnier on the EU side, uh, as Stephanie Riso, as well as Oliver Lewis, uh, Tim Barrow, Lindsay Appleby, many others. Uh, their work will be available for scrutiny, uh, followed by a parliamentary vote, uh, I hope, on December the 30th. This agreement, this deal, above all, means certainty. It means certainty for the aviation industry and the hauliers who have suffered so much in the COVID pandemic. It means certainty for the police, the border forces, the security services, all those we rely on across Europe to keep us all safe. It means certainty for our scientists who will be able to work together and continue to work together on great collective projects because although we want in the UK to be a science superpower, we also want to be a, a collaborative science superpower. And above all, it means certainty for business. Uh, from uh, financial services to our world-leading manufacturers, our, our car industry, a certainty uh, for all those uh, who are working in high-skilled jobs uh, and uh, in firms and uh, factories across the whole, the whole country. Because there will be no uh, palisade of tariffs on January the 1st, and there will be no non-tariff barriers to, to trade. Uh, instead, there will be a giant free trade zone of which we will at once be a member and at the same time be able to do our own free trade deals as one UK whole and entire England, Northern Ireland, Scotland, Wales together. And I should stress this deal was done by a huge negotiating team from every part of the UK and it will benefit every part of our United Kingdom, helping to unite and level up across the country. And so I say again uh, directly to our EU friends and partners, I think this deal means a new stability and a new uh, certainty in what has sometimes been a fractious and difficult relationship. We will be your friend, your ally, your supporter, and indeed never let it be forgotten, your number one market. Because although we have left the EU, this country will remain culturally, emotionally, historically, strategically, geologically attached to Europe. Not least, of course, through the four million EU nationals who have requested to settle in the UK over the last uh, four years and who make an enormous contribution to uh, our country and to our lives. And I say to all of you at home at the end of this toughest of years that our focus in the weeks ahead is, of course, on defeating uh, the, the pandemic and on be beating uh, coronavirus and rebuilding our economy and delivering jobs across the country. And I'm utterly confident that we can and will do it. We've, uh, by today, we've vaccinated almost 800,000 people. And we've also today resolved a question that has bedeviled our politics for decades. And it is up to us all together as a newly and truly independent nation to realize the immensity of this moment and to make the most of it. Happy Christmas to you all. That's the good news from Brussels. Now for the Sprouts. Actually, it's now for the media. Uh, let's, go to the, let's go to the media, who I think uh, we've got Laura Koonsberg. Uh, over to you, Laura.
Thank you very much, Prime Minister. We're yet to see the text of this deal, which we understand runs to some 2,000 pages. You've presumably had the benefit of um, poring over every word, or maybe perhaps not every single word. But can you tell the public honestly, where did the UK give the most ground? And where did the EU compromise the most, do you think? Um, thanks, Laura. Well, actually, it's only about 500 pages. And uh, I, th I think it would, and it's, it's readily intelligible, uh, I, I think. Uh, I think the, it would be fair to say that um, we, wanted, we wanted to uh, make sure, for instance, that uh, we got access to, uh, got complete control of, of our fisheries from the, the get-go, and that's just to, to say we had annual negotiations on fisheries uh, within the shortest possible delay. Uh, the EU began with, I think, wanting uh, a, a transition period of 14 years. Uh, we wanted three years. We've ended up at, at five years. Uh, I think that was a, a, reasonable, uh, a reasonable transition period. And uh, I can assure uh, great fish fanatics in this country, we will, as a result of this deal, be able to uh, catch and eat quite prodigious quantities of extra fish. So... Uh, it's, that's why we're going to have to make these investments in the, in the fishing sector. Thanks uh, very much, Laura. Uh, let's go to, to, to Robert Peston of ITV. Sorry, Robert, you need to unmute. You need to unmute, Robert. Yeah. Uh, Prime Minister, you said all along you, you wanted a Canada-style deal, but what you've agreed means that we in the UK have to follow EU rules on subsidies, on tax, on workers' rights, on the environment, or potentially incur the imposition of tariffs. That's right, isn't it? I mean, we've just heard Ursula von der Leyen say that she got her level playing field, which you've explicitly rejected all the way through. You also just said there would be no non-tariff barriers. Again, that's not right. From January the 1st, as a result of leaving the customs union, and Michael Gove has been warning about this week in, week out for months, there is a ton of new bureaucracy on British businesses, lots of new non-tariff barriers. This is not to say the deal is a bad deal, but you're not selling it correctly, are you? You're misselling it. No. Uh, well, I respectfully uh, disagree with you because uh, there is indeed a, a clause in the in the deal which uh, is uh, nothing like as as damaging as it as it was and is, in my view, uh, neutralised. Which says that uh, if either country feel that uh, the, the other one is in some way undercutting them or, or dumping in, in some way, then uh, subject to uh, arbitration and provided the measure is uh, proportionate, uh, and that, I mean, independent arbitration, not arbitration by the European Court of Justice, but subject to an independent power, they can, if they really choose, uh, put on uh, tariffs to, to protect their, their consumers and their and their businesses. And to give you an example of the kind of thing where that might occur, for instance, in the UK, uh, we uh, want to do, uh, go further on animal welfare standards. And uh, it might be that we do things, uh, for instance, on uh, how, you, how you rear uh, pigs, uh, banning sow crates and so on, uh, that would incur extra costs for our, uh, our pig farmers. Uh, and uh, it might be that bacon coming from elsewhere in, in the, from, from the uh, EU was, uh, was at risk of, therefore, of undercutting us. We might, under those circumstances, consider uh, imposing tariffs. I think it's highly unlikely, but we might uh, consider it. It would be, have to be subject to, to arbitration. Uh, it would have to be proportionate, according to uh, the arbitrator. And under no circumstances would we be in any way uh, constrained, uh, legally or otherwise, by anything that the EU did or chose to do uh, themselves, uh, nor, furthermore, uh, would there be any uh, role uh, for the European Court of Justice. And for, for people at home who have uh, zoned out while I've been talking about this, uh, <laughs> let me tell you, this is a very, very long day's march uh, from uh, where we were a, f a few years ago. You will remember, Robert, when we were talking about basically having a common rule book uh, with the EU and having dynamic alignment uh, with EU law so that the UK was forced to, to keep step. And uh, that has gone 
uh, from this treaty insofar as the uh, EU wanted it, and there is no uh, role for uh, the European Court of Justice, uh, whatever. So I think it's, uh, I think it's a, a, a great treaty. And uh, as for your point about uh, non-tariff barriers, yes, I think it's, it's important to stress uh, um, what I'm talking about is uh, barriers on, on the grounds of, uh, you know, uh, your plugs w won't work in our, in our country, therefore they're banned or whatever. Um, uh, that, that, kind of, that kind of technical barriers to trade. And there's a lot in this treaty to try to reduce uh, all that kind of thing, make sure that doesn't, uh, that doesn't happen. That's a good thing. That's a good thing uh, for businesses and, and consumers. And in that sense, it's a great free trade deal. But uh, I must stress to people getting ready for January the 1st that... Um, you know, there will be change. So people will need their, as you know, get on the, the gov.uk website, exporters will need their AO reforms and, uh, and everything else. People should be aware of the change that is coming. But there's also an opportunity, because for British exporters now, the whole world uh, it will be treated the same for export purposes. And I think that would actually galvanise our exporters to think much more positively and, and dynamically about the, the opportunities that they have. So uh, I, I must respectfully disagree with both the points that, uh, uh, that, that you made. This is a, this is a, a jumbo Canada-style uh, free trade deal uh, of exactly the kind that I think this country needs. And, it, and as I say, I believe it resolves a, a long-standing and uh, very, very difficult uh, problem. Uh, people said you couldn't uh, be part of, the, uh, of a free trade zone with the EU without being obliged to uh, follow uh, EU laws. If you remember, uh, people, I, I, th I think there was a, it was, I think we were told we couldn't have our cake and eat it and that kind of uh, thing. I'm not, going to, I'm not going to claim that this is a cakeist uh, treaty, uh, Robert, but, um, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, because that, but it is, it is I, I believe, uh, what the country needs at this time and uh, the right way forward for, for the UK. Let's go to, to Sam Coates of Sky. I'm going to say, you say this is an unprecedented deal that observes all your red lines and promises to the country. Can people trust that life will be better as a result of this deal and that there won't be any disruption even in the short term? And can you guarantee the government won't up re end up reopening elements of the new relationship in the years to come? Well, Sam, I mean, really good, really good questions. I mean, short term, uh, yes, as I said just now, there are things we have to get right, process that, the processes that maybe people have to... To, to do that they need to be aware of, and I'm going to assume you know, that point really is worth uh, reinforcing. Uh, I do believe that the freedoms that this treaty wins us, basically uh, a, a new independence from uh, the EU, are, are worth having. But, you know, uh, and so free ports, free trade deals, being able to uh, do, as I say, uh, to, to look after your, uh, your, 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 your livestock differently, uh, improving your, 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 your landscape in a different way, uh, doing all sorts of things differently, regulating financial services differently, uh, chemicals, all sorts of things where we, want, we may want to do things differently and, and better. But I would just say to, to people watching this, and I'm sorry for disturbing Cars 3, by the way, uh, to, say, to people watching this, I would say it's one thing to get freedom, Winning freedom is a fantastic thing, and, and that, this is an important element of what we've done. But it's how we use it, how we make the most of it. Uh, that's what's going to matter in the, in the, in the months and, and years to come. And I've, I've no doubt that we can do uh, fantastic things uh, with this treaty, if we, uh, and with this new relationship, which I think will be stable and prosperous for, for both sides. Let's go to, to, to Tom Newton Dunn of, of Times Radio. Good afternoon, Prime Minister, and thank you. A couple of uh, quick questions, if you don't mind. Uh, every deal means both sides have to compromise. Do you accept that you have compromised throughout the last 11 months, particularly perhaps the last 11 days, from perhaps your earlier slightly absolutist positions, perhaps that was a, a negotiating ploy? But compromise is not a dirty word. Do you agree with that? And secondly, can you address services? Because I haven't heard you say much about that. 80% of course of the UK economy, you say some British companies would do, uh, do more trade with the EU because of this deal. Will the British service sector, especially the financial services sector, will they be able to do more trade or less trade? 
Well, I, I, there's, a, there's a, first of all, on the compromise point, now compromise isn't a dirty word, and, we, and unquestionably there are things that uh, we've done uh, to, to help our friends and, and partners to, to move things forward. You know, I, I mentioned, I think, to Laura uh, where we got to on fish. Uh, we, you know, we, we, we started out uh, wanting uh, a very short um, uh, transition period, uh, of, of, of three years, they wanted a much longer one of 14 years. We've we've compromised on that at, uh, at five and a half, and on on you know uh, so the so the vital services sector. Uh, yes, of course, so they, they will they they feature in this uh, in this deal quite quite rightly. Uh, for that, there's a there's a, some good language about equivalence for. Uh, financial services, uh, perhaps not as much as uh, as we would have liked, but it is nonetheless, uh, you know, going to enable our dynamic City of London uh, to get on and prosper uh, as, as never before. There's some good stuff about um, uh, uh, barristers, solicitors, lawyers uh, being able to uh, practice uh, around the, uh, the European Union. Uh, we will be able to uh, continue to have massive uh, and growing uh, economic interpenetration uh, without the need for um, uh, uh, what I've always talked about, this, this lunar pull of, uh, of EU law. This, uh, and and I, as I say, this is, this is something that I think can benefit uh, people on both sides of the, of the channel. It'll be a healthy, dynamic, productive, happy, stable relationship. That's what we're aiming for. Let's go to George Parker of the FT. Thank you, Prime Minister. You mentioned the change that will happen at the border in any event on January the 1st. I just wondered if there was anything in this deal where the two sides have agreed to introduce some sort of flexibility at the border to make sure we don't have chaos in Dover and Calais on January the 1st. And a second more general point, um, you and I used to be reporters in Brussels and we've covered the sort of psychodrama of British-EU relations for a number of decades. Nigel Farage said today that the war is over I just wondered if you saw it in those terms. No, I think the uh, first of all on on uh, on on the border and measures to uh, the, there are there are all sorts of things in the treaty that uh, what you will recognise about trusted uh, trader schemes and uh, special measures on sanitary and phytosanitary uh, recognition and and steps to uh, uh, make sure that you know things flow as smoothly as we possibly can. Though again, I stress that there will be things that people have to do. Look, I mean, the the one of the great the EU was a an ex, uh, was and is an extraordinary concept, and it was born out of the agony of the of the Second World War, uh, uh, founded by uh, idealistic people uh, in France and Germany. Uh, and Italy, uh, who, n who never wanted uh, those countries to go to war uh, with each other again, and, uh, and other countries, uh, Belgium, Holland, and others. And uh, in many ways, it's an, it, it was and is a very noble enterprise. Uh, uh, so I, you know, I don't recognize that the kind of language that you, that you talk of. I, I think that the UK's own relationship with it was always difficult. Uh, we always found some of the the language about ever closer union, the idea of uh, of this political uh, union, this very dense idea of, uh, of of this ideology of endless integration, we found quite hard, George. And I think you you know, as a, as a fellow Brussels uh, reporter, you'll remember that there was there was quite a lot of friction involved. I think that what we've got here is the basis of a new long-term friendship and partnership that basically stabilises that relationship. And insofar as the UK needs to be, and always must be, a great European power, always must be, a great, great European power, where they're outside the main body of the, of the EU, but where they're as a friend and as a supporter, as a, as a, as a flying buttress, if you like, uh, that to, to make sure, as we have done so many times in the last uh, couple of hundred years, that we're able to lend our voice when it's uh, when it's needed and to be of, of value to our European friends and partners in a, in a strategic way. And that's what the UK will obviously continue to do. But I think the, the, the very dense programme of integration wasn't right for the, for the UK. And that's why it was right to take back control in the way that we, that we have. And uh, I think that uh, this, deal, this deal expresses uh, what the people of the country 
uh, voted for in, uh, in 2016. And I think there was a wisdom in what they decided, and uh, I think that we'll be able to go forward on this basis. Let's go to Gordon Rayner of The Telegraph. Thank you, Prime Minister, and uh, Merry Christmas for tomorrow. Um, could I just ask, uh, probably half the people watching this right now would have voted Remain uh, in the referendum in 2016. Uh, do you have a particular message for them? Uh, you know, people today are tweeting that uh, this is a, a bad deal, that it's not what they what they wanted. They would rather have stayed in. What's your message to them? Um, and just secondly, could I also ask you, we've had more figures today on COVID. You mentioned COVID earlier. Um, can you rule out um, another national lockdown after Christmas? Uh, well, Gordon, thanks. I, I think my message to everybody on both sides of the divide is I, uh, of that argument in 2016 is I really think we, it's now a long time behind us. And I think most people that I talk to, whichever way uh, they were inclined to vote back then, just want it settled and want us to move on. And I think this gives us the, the platform, uh, the foundation for a really prosperous new relationship. And I would be very excited uh, now by, by this, this deal. You know, this European question has been going on for decades, uh, exactly what relationship uh, we should have. Uh, this is a, a, a great new free trade deal, uh, a, a trading relationship and partnership that I think will uh, bring prosperity to, to both sides of the channel. And um, on uh, uh, coronavirus and uh, the, the, the struggle there, Obviously, we face a very considerable uh, new pressures, particularly from the, 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 the new variant and the speed with which that's been, uh, that's been spreading. Uh, we believe that uh, we're going to have to get through this tough period now with, as I say, as I said many times, very tough restrictions with tough tiering, uh, and uh, you, you'll have seen what's been announced over the last uh, day or so about that. And, and much as I regret that, I do think it is necessary uh, for us to grip this virus now to stop it running out of control uh, in, in January, uh, because we need to buy ourselves time to get the vaccine into as many arms uh, of the elderly and, and vulnerable as we can. And that is the, that is the real way in which we will uh, defeat the, the virus. So it's, it's, it's tough tiering, community testing, and and rolling out the vaccine, and we're going to, we're going to continue uh, with, with, with that approach. And uh, I, I know that uh, it, it's been very, very tough over the last uh, few weeks, and I must tell people it will continue uh, to be difficult, uh, not least basically because of the, uh, the speed with which the new variant is, is spreading. But the vaccine is going into people's arms, and there really is now, I think, a hope uh, the certainty that uh, we will have it, uh, we will have it defeated, as I say, uh, by uh, by the spring. Or well, that's certainly what the scientists uh, still believe, and they're still uh, they're still confident of that. So, thanks very much, Gordon. Let's go to to Harry Cole of the Sun. Thank you, Prime Minister. Can you give us some more details about the new security arrangements with the EU? Are we going to be as safe uh, next week in your under your new security partnership as we are today? given that Brussels are saying that they're going to lock us out of live EU databases. And uh, given you've locked us all up, how will you uh, recommend we celebrate leaving the EU next week? Well, uh, Harry, look, I, le I, I leave your, your, your manner of celebration entirely to, 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 to you and to individual taste. I wouldn't I would want, I mean, we've, I think the government's done quite enough bossing people around and uh, recommending this or that over the last, uh, over the last 10 months or so. Uh, but on on security and uh, police cooperation, I'm you know absolutely confident this is a uh, a deal that protects our uh, police cooperation, protects uh, our ability to uh, catch criminals and uh, to share intelligence across uh, the European uh, continent in the way that uh, we have done uh, for for many years. So uh, I uh, I don't think people should have fears on that score, or indeed on any, any score. Uh, let's go to Heather Stewart of The Guardian. Hello, Prime Minister. Um, it, it, Michel Barnier said today that we decided to leave the Erasmus exchange scheme, which sent thousands of students to EU countries every year. 
I wonder what you'd say to young people who feel as though opportunities to discover the continent on our doorstep by li li living there or studying there or working there are being taken away from them. Um, and secondly, just do you have a message for Keir Starmer, who will have to decide in the coming hours and days how to whip Labour MPs, whether, whether they should support your deal? Uh, right, uh, Heather, well, look, on, the, on, on Erasmus, it was a tough decision. Uh, the, the, the issue really was that, um, as you know, the, the, the UK is a massive net contributor to the continent's higher education economy, because uh, over the last uh, decades, we've... Uh, had so many uh, EU nationals, which we've, uh, it's been a wonderful thing, uh, uh, but our, our arrangements basically mean that financially the UK exchequer uh, more or less loses out on the, on, the, on the deal. Erasmus was also extremely uh, expensive. So what we're doing is uh, producing a, uh, a, a UK uh, scheme for students to go around the world, and it'll be called the Turing uh, Scheme, and it will so, so so students will have the opportunity to uh, no not Alan Turing so the students will have the opportunity not just to go to European uh, universities but to go to uh, the best universities uh, in the world because we want our, our young people to uh, experience uh, the uh, immense intellectual uh, stimulation of, uh, of of Europe but also of the of the whole world and as for I think you you asked about which way should the opposition vote on this. Well, it's perfectly obvious, uh, uh, Heather, the opposition should vote for this excellent deal. And, uh, and I would strongly encourage uh, everybody uh, to do the same. Thank you very much, everybody. Happy Christmas to you all. Thank you.